A warm welcome this morning to you all um, for our webinar, Making Personal Budgets Personal. My name is Arlene Crockett um, and I work with the Life Changes Trust and I have the pleasure today of chairing this learning event. Um, there's a few things that I want to run through today as well as today's programme, just from the point of view of some house housekeeping. There's a break scheduled in the programme, so if you feel you need a little more time away from your screen, then please do so. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Life Changes Trust website in a few days. So you can catch up if you miss anything. You will all be notified when this happens um, through the email that you registered with um, as part of today's session. During the webinar, if you want to ask a question of the speakers or the panel, then please feel free to do so. You can put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. There is also a chat function as well as a Q&A section. So this is for general comments. So please feel free to do that as well. In the function, there is a wee drop down menu that gives you the option to share your comments with the panel or with everyone. I think it's nice for everybody to see the comments. So if you're OK with sharing the comments with everyone, then please select um, panel and attendees for that. So thanks for bearing with me and for your patience to just run through that. So now on to today's event. I'll be giving you a short overview, so you'll be listening to me for about five or ten minutes about the individual award scheme and a reminder of what they were and how we delivered them. Then we'll be hearing about some of the key learning that has come from the evaluation of our individual award scheme, courtesy of Janet Bigot from The Lines Between, who carried out the evaluation. We will then spend a few minutes sharing some personal stories from the individual award scheme looking at two families living with dementia and how they spent their awards and their experiences of having flexibility, choice and control. Then we're off to the Bonnie Isle of Orkney, where Gillian Skews from Age Scotland Orkney caught up with Peter Work, who cares for his wife who has dementia. Peter talks about his journey through self-directed support and how it has helped him and his wife Moira be more secure and happy at home. And we'll also hear from Shapana Hussain Ahmed from the Coalition of Carers in Scotland, who will be joining us to talk about the findings of a survey they undertook to find out whether unpaid carers and those they care for were aware of the new Scottish Government and COSLA guidance around self-directed support during the COVID pandemic. It also asked carers whether they had been able to use their self-directed support in a more flexible way during lockdown. So a busy morning for you all. So hope you're sitting comfortably and have a refreshment in hand. And don't forget, you'll have a chance to ask any questions in our Q&A section later this morning. So do please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time. So first, you're going to hear a little bit from me. I'm going to give you an overview of why we are hosting today's event, some background to the Life Changes Trust and talk about the individual individual award scheme, sorry, and some things to consider. So many thanks to you all for joining us today. We wanted to host this session to share some of the learning with you from the individual awards projects we funded and to show how this could be helpful to people who may have a budget or funding of their own through self-directed support or other means or who are interested in applying. We want to share examples of good practice as well as acknowledge the real challenges faced by people. We are also aware that people have faced additional barriers during the pandemic. After the event, we will send an email with links to the recording of the session, as well as links to the organisations who have presented today, if you want to pursue that any further. I'm now going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about the Life Changes Trust, explaining briefly about our individual award scheme, identifying some similarities to self-directed support in the learning, and then finished by sharing a quote from a carer who received one of the awards. The Life Changes Trust was set up by Big Lottery, now the National Lottery Community Fund, to administer a £50 million legacy, with a specific focus on three beneficiary groups. £25 million was for young people with care experience, and £25 million for people with dementia and the unpaid carers of people with dementia. The aim was to invest in and support the empowerment and inclusion of these beneficiary groups. The first funding for the Dementia Programme went out in 2015, and since then, the Trust has funded over 212 projects. Examples of this will be our Dementia Friendly Communities projects that some of you might be involved in, our Rights Made Real projects, 
and to get outdoors projects. These are to name but a few. This funding has directly supported over 19,500 people with dementia and just under 10,000 unpaid carers. So that's some background to the Life Changes Trust for those in our webinar today who might not know much about us. I'd like now to take a few minutes to talk about the Individual Awards Scheme funded by the Life Changes Trust. The Life Changes Trust opened its first Individual Awards Scheme as a pilot in October 2015, closing it in mid-January 2016. This provided small amounts of funding to a number of individuals living with dementia and unpaid carers to help improve their well-being and quality of life. In the pilot, a total of just over £193,000 was awarded to 40, 438 individuals, with grants of up to £500 for each person. The learning from the pilot was then used to launch phase two of the scheme, this time running in Aberdeen, Angus and Lochaber from April to September 2018. This too was evaluated and you will hear more from Janet from the lines between later this morning about this. Both schemes focused on awarding small grants to people with dementia and unpaid carers and learned about the impact of this on their lives and their wider family and community. Key to this was a focus on the broadest of criteria, relationships, and that people were trusted to not only receive the funding, but to spend it in a way that made a difference to their lives, taking into account that this may change and need to be flexible. So what did this mean in practice? What was applied for had meaning for the person with dementia and or the unpaid carer. It was not something that they had to fit into, but was something that they wanted. It was something that made a difference to their lives. It could be something that gave them a break, something that was practical to lighten the load, or something that helped connect them to friends and to family. This would mean different things to different people. What they applied for would be something they probably couldn't have done without accessing the scheme something that ordinarily wouldn't be covered under usual criteria. And there would be no financial assessment to go through to apply and then be granted the award. It was not means tested, nor was it income related. And so how might this be different, for example, from SDS? As I know some of you on the call may have experience of this or be considering it. Self-directed support is how social care in Scotland is delivered since the Scottish Government passed the Social Care Scotland Act in 2013. People are able to use self-direct, people are able to self-direct their care and support in a number of different ways using the four options noted on this slide, but within eligibility criteria set by local authorities. So I'll just go through those four options. The person chooses to take a direct payment, so that can be money paid to direct your own support, for example, to employ a personal assistant. The person can choose to allocate a budget to an organisation and the person chooses how the budget is spent. The person can choose that the council arranges and directs the services or the person can choose a mix of options one to three. This means the person can choose several options where you require, for instance, different types of care. I'm not going to get into any more detail about that because I know Shapana from the Carers Coalition is going to do this very soon but there are real synergies between SDS and the Individual Award Scheme. Both are about putting people in control of the support they need to live the life they choose. What is key, however, is the importance of supported decision-making and, and what it takes to make this happen for people with dementia and for unpaid carers. There are many things to consider when a person is applying for an award or a personal budget. Individual means individual. There will be some common requests, but also lots of variety. Criteria is important, but there needs to be a focus on the person, what is meaningful and what will make the difference. People are more likely to make the most of an individual award opportunity when they are supported by an organisation or a person with whom they have a trusting relationship. The process, for example, applying for funding needs to be done in a way that works for the person. This includes how this is done, where this is done and the time this takes and by who. It needs to reflect changes in the person's life. People, appreci people appreciate feeling they are trusted and to receive funding directly. This creates the conditions for people to think creatively. And finally, underpinning this all is the importance of relationships. This improves people's peace of mind and empowers them to have greater choice and control over their lives. 
The impact of this is much more than the action or the intervention that I've talked about, but it's about the lasting effects on people, their families, and what takes place further down the line. Recognising that this means different things for different people is crucial in how we move forward. And I think this quote from one of the individual awardees from Argyll and Butte sums it up beautifully. The good thing was that they gave us money and they gave us the freedom to do it ourselves, our way. So that's enough from me just now. I think I've spoken enough um, already this morning. Um, so I'd like to now carry on with the programme for today's webinar. So I'd like to introduce you now to Janet, Janet Bigger. With all of our projects, we have, once we've issued funding, we also commission an evaluation and our individual award scheme was no exception. The lines between were commissioned to carry out this work and the report looks at the impacts of our individual awards and what the key learning has been. To tell us a wee bit more, I'd now like to welcome Janet to our webinar today from the lines between. Over to you, Janet. Thank you, Arlene, and hello, everyone. Lovely to, to see so many people here. Um, so as Arlene has said, the individual award scheme gave people with dementia and unpaired, paid, unpaid carers of people with dementia up to £500 each to spend on whatever would make a difference to them. Um, there weren't any rules about the kind of thing this money could or couldn't be spent on. It was just something that would make a difference. And the people receiving the awards chose these things themselves. Sometimes they had some help from their family or from someone they knew from an organisation like Alzheimer's Scotland to think about what would make a difference to them. Often this person helped them with filling in the forms as well. And one of our key findings was that this sort of support from a known and trusted person was really helpful in encouraging people to apply and to get the most out of the opportunity to choose to spend what to spend a little bit of money on for themselves. It, it just sparked that creativity um, in, in thinking through ideas that Arlene was talking about and made people feel supported through the process. Um, because for a lot of people, this was very new. It's not often that somebody gives you some money of any amount that, um, that you have control over what you spend it on without any eligibility criteria or rules. So we found that people did not have big fancy ideas. The ideas they had covered a huge range of different things. So I'm going to give you some examples of the sorts of things. So this woman here in the picture spent some money, uh, some of her award on her wheels, as she calls them. And I'll tell you a bit more about her later. She was a lovely woman with a lovely family. Um, and as you can see there, she's very happy and smiley with, with, with her wheels. Other people chose things like household goods, like TVs, cookers, fridge freezers, chairs or beds. Some people chose to spend their award on help with jobs in the garden or in the house. Um, or home improvements like new carpet or decorating a room or installing a wet room or some decking or some paths in the garden. A really popular choice was chip, trips away to see fam, family or friends or to visit old haunts or for carers to spend some time with their children or families doing something just for a break. Obviously, the money didn't extend to a Caribbean cruise, but that wasn't what people thought would make a difference to them. One woman went to see the TT motorbike race in the Isle of Man, which had been a lifelong ambition for her um, that she hadn't yet fulfilled. Um, and one woman went with her sister to Jersey, where they'd spent a lot of their childhood years. And they went back and looked at the house where their auntie had lived and the places they used to play and that kind of thing. There was a lovely story about a man who'd been in the RAF and he used his award to pay for himself and his wife and his family to attend a ceremony where he was receiving a certificate for his role in recovering the bodies from an American plane that had crashed during the war. In a similar vein, there was a couple who used their money to pay for a big family party for their 60th wedding anniversary. Having the money meant they could afford a meal in a nice hotel with space for the whole extended family and some new clothes to wear for the occasion. They did look very splendid, I've seen the photos. Some sent, spent their award on things like tablets or smartphones. Others spent their award on necessities that are difficult to afford and, and they'd been making do without things like new glasses or car repairs or new bedding or curtains. 
So that's a little bit about the scale of the individual awards and the sorts of things people spent their money in. One thing that was particularly important when we were carrying out the evaluation was what kind of impacts these awards had. So we found that although the things people spent their award on were not, not necessarily fancy or extraordinary, they often had impacts far beyond their initial value. So the lady with the wheels that I just showed you, for example, her family take her out on foot much more now than they, than they did before. She can walk further, she's less likely to fall, and she can even put her shopping in the wee bag. Before she got her wheels, she mostly was taken out in the car and mostly only for essentials, not for the pleasure of going for a walk because she was too unsteady on her feet. So the wheels had to, have had a huge impact on the amount of fresh air and exercise that she gets, which has impacts for her physical health and her mental health. And there've also been impacts for the wider family who can enjoy their time with her much more and are feeling less stressed and worried when they do take her out. This, this slide is a photo of a shed. Not very exciting, you might think, but it had a huge impact for the couple who used their award money to buy it. They had recently had to move away from their home and garden of many years to a flat with no outside space. But they're lucky enough to have a caravan down the coast from where they live, which they still go to many weekends. However, the husband, who has dementia, particularly missed his garden shed. He didn't know where to put himself without it and was frequently anxious. So this couple spent their award on a new shed exactly the same as the old one and put it next to their caravan. Now their weekends away are calmer and they both feel they are having a proper break. She suggests a job for him to do in the shed and he will have a happy, purposeful time tidying the shelves or whatever that job is. And she can have a quiet cuppa and read her book. They're, they're together 24 seven the rest of the time. And this gave them both a big break with huge impacts for their stress and anxiety levels, which also has impacts on their physical health and their ability to cope with daily life the rest of the time. Often we find there were impacts on other people, like the, the Beals lady's family. Another example was the wider family of a couple who used their award to pay for someone to help with cleaning and gardening. The couple now have more time to spend together and to socialise. The husband, who's the carer, feels less exhausted and their kids are less worried for him. They also enjoy visiting more because they can now relax and spend social time with their parents rather than rushing about trying to help with jobs in the house or garden while their exhausted dad falls asleep in his chair. The extra social connection, both with family and friends, has a big impact on the wife as well. She has what her husband describes as happy dementia and really responds to social interaction. So they go to the golf club and lunch with friends while their cleaner is in the house. One, one man caring for his wife in Aberdeen spent the award on a new cooker, which is, such, which is much easier to keep clean and saves him time. So now he cooks more meals from fresh than he did before. So that has health impacts for both himself and his wife. Carers who use the money to have a break or a treat for themselves stress the impact of that. Improved relationships with the person they care for and with the rest of their family, they came back feeling refreshed, recharged, less tired and better able to cope with their caring role. People who have dementia and the people they care for them spend a lot of time at home. So for those who spent their money on home improvements, there were also big impacts. Redecorating gave people a project to get into and a more comfortable, attractive environment. One woman was no longer embarrassed to have visitors but once she'd redecorated her living room. So there was an impact there on her social life and the extent to which she was feeling isolated. Another was no longer worried about tripping on her ripped carpet and was much, obviously had reduced anxiety there and that had an impact on how she felt in general. Another couple spent their reward on decking and a path in their garden, which meant they were able to spend more time out there without worrying about falling over on, and, and being able to push a wheelchair to, out into the garden. So that had impacts on their physical health and their mental well-being because they could spend time outdoors unworried and, and, and getting about. There were also many impacts in terms of people being able to stay independent for longer. For example, people who converted or put the money towards converting or adapting ba a bathroom or installing a wet room, that gave people the opportunity to, to be able to, to need less help in the, with their personal care or in the bathroom and to feel more independent and in control day to day with their personal care. People got riser chairs or new mowers or new hoovers. 
that they could manage more easily and more easily move around their home um, to do daily tasks and to keep coping and feeling independent at home for longer. So it's clear that the impact of these awards was significant, but they weren't just effective in the short term. We found that the benefits of the awards, as well as the impact, was long lasting. So for memories, for example, the people who, for people who have dementia and for carers of people who have dementia, obviously memories are very important. So the couple who had the 60th wedding anniversary in the big hotel had beautiful family photos on their wall taken at the event and cherished daily. They lit up when they showed me them and taught me through who everyone was and how special the day had been. The woman who went to the TTs had an album she still looks at regularly, enjoying the memories that those photos bring back and reliving the pleasure that she, that she got from that event. So in daily life, for people who use the award to buy something like a new washing machine or a walking frame or a TV or a bed, this item continues to make a difference to their daily lives. The impact on their level of comfort or independence or safety or stress is an ongoing thing. People who spent their award on practical help like garden work or home improvements or, or um, cleaning or whatever, were still benefiting when we spoke to them, often many months later from those improvements to their environment. Day-to-day -day life was made easier or time or energy was freed up to spend socially, staying connected with their family or their friends or neighbourhoods. And that brings me on to connection. So, for example, one, one unpaid carer explained that his mum had deteriorated significantly when she'd had a period in hospital and her mood was low and her willingness to social, socialise had decreased. Um, and he worked out that that was because she didn't have the stimulation of, of TV. She was very fond of, of various TV programmes and her TV at home was, was old and she was worried it was about to pack in. Her award was spent on a new TV um, so she now has lively discussions with him and with her carers about the programmes that she's seen and plans to watch. That helps her feel more connected to the world. She's, she's engaging more with other people and chit-chatting around the things that she's watching. People who spent their award on digital equipment like tablets or smartphones are now finding keeping in touch with family far away much easier and we're having regular video calls, for example. So they have an ongoing pleasure for, for these people in maybe talking to their grandchildren every day and actually being able to see them and, and be shown things that they've been doing and vice versa. So these are wonderful things to hear about. So in summary, you don't really need to, me to tell you this, but it doesn't take much. We learned that things don't need to be expensive or fancy to make a big and long lasting difference to people's lives. People know themselves what will make a difference to them, even if they sometimes need a little support from someone they know and trust to work out what that is. This is financial empowerment. This is feeling in control. Impacts ripple out from the immediately obvious to wider benefits in relation to emotional and physical health, independence, connection and interaction, helping people to feel in control and to live a good life at home for longer. So that's me. I'm going to hand you back now to Arlene. Many thanks, Janet. And I think um, with a comment there from, from one of the attendees to say that these are just such brilliant stories and really shows the the real impacts of the awards, both in the short term and the long term. And, and I just love the idea of people, you know, giving themselves a treat because often it's all bound by criteria and, and rules and regulations. So it's good to be able to see that flexibility and control um, being utilised in a really meaningful way. So in saying that, we now want to bring you some of those personal stories from our individual award scheme. It took a little bit, we, to, to look a bit really at what people with dementia and their unpaid carers had spent their awards on. So some of this will be um, from what Janet said. So you'll, you'll be really reliving this, but in a different way. And their experiences of having flexibility, choice and control. Our friends from outside the box took two of the stories and turned them into animations. We hope you enjoy meeting the Johnson family and Anne and her family. Thank you. 
everyone enjoyed that um i certainly never tire from watching that animation for sure it really illustrates i think very well the impact of the individual awards for those people um who were in receipt of them just um from lots of many points of view so it's really good to see that illustrated in a really different way and many thanks to outside the box um who we definitely will be using in the future for many other events in terms of illustrating that impact so can I just quickly, I've been reminded to remind you to put any questions in the Q&A section at the bottom um, of your screen if you have any so far. And also if you want to keep comment in the chat function, just to remember to do that um, to panellists and attendees so that we all get to have a look at, at your comments. So it's now time for me to introduce Shapana Hussein Ahmed, um, who's a Partnership Development Officer at the Coalition of Carers in Scotland. Shapana is going to talk to us about the findings of a survey undertaken by the Coalition. The survey wanted to find out whether unpaid carers and those they care for were aware of the new Scottish Government and COSLA guidance around self-directed support during the COVID pandemic. It also asked carers whether they had been able to use the self-directed support in a more flexible way during lockdown. I'm going to pass over now to Shapana to tell us what they found. Over to you, Shapana. Thank you, Arlene, and um, thank you to Life Changes Trust for the invitation to come along today and share some of the work that we've been doing around um, understanding the experiences of unpaid carers using SDS during this pandemic. Um, so just before I do that, I thought it would be useful to just say a little bit about what self-directed support actually is and some of the different options that are available with self-directed support. Um, I'm aware that Arlene's um, covered some of this already in her presentation, so I won't um, necessarily go over what each of the four SDS options are. Um, but what I will do here is just, just reiterate that self-directed support is there to enable people with support needs and unpaid carers to have more control, choice and autonomy over how their support is delivered. And anybody who meets the local eligibility criteria for social care support should be offered a choice of all four options. So 
we also know that during the, the pandemic, um, it brought with it many changes to the way in which support and SDS was being delivered. So let's now take a look at what happened with SDS when the pandemic hit way back in March. So at the start of the pandemic, around March time, there were a number of things that happened which impacted on social care support. So we had care providers who reduced or shut down their services. We had care staff who were being furloughed. We had households who were shielding. We had people who just did not want outsiders coming into their homes. All of this ultimately led to people with support needs and unpaid carers having to go without some essential social care and support. So in response to this, the, Sc the, the Scottish Government and COSLA issued some additional SDS guidance in May. So this guidance was asking councils to allow those with SDS options one and two to be able to use their budgets um, to purchase alternative support and to allow more flexibility on what that support looked like. It also encouraged more autonomy for social workers to be able to make some of those decisions around care packages and to reduce bureaucracy at a time when the system needed to be far more flexible and responsive to the immediate needs. However, despite this guidance, we at the coalition were beginning to hear anecdotally from a a number of carers that they were not being able to access services and also not really being able to use their budgets on any alternative support either. So in June of this year, we carried out a short survey to see whether this was something which was only perhaps happening in some local authority areas or whether in fact it was more widespread. We had 208 carers from across Scotland respond to the survey and we asked them if they were aware of this new guidance around using their budgets for alternative support and whether they were being allowed to use their budgets more flexibly. So the survey highlighted some really interesting findings, which I will be sharing today, but I thought if we could begin by looking at perhaps some of the more positive findings first. So around one in five carers had been able to use their self-directed support budgets in a more flexible way to support a loved one during the pandemic. However, it's probably worth noting that this also means that around four out of those five carers were potentially unable to use their budgets in a more flexible way. And that's something I'll come back to in a bit. But for now, um, let's take a closer look at those who were able to use their budgets more flexibly. So what kind of things were carers and people with support needs using their SDS budgets for? Um, again, there were a variety of things, one of which was accessing digital support. So. A number of support organisations had now moved to only providing support online and restrictions on meeting people from other households meant that many people were now far more isolated in their own homes as well. So for some folk, they were now able to use their SDS budgets to purchase things like laptops and iPads or subscriptions to Zoom to keep in touch with friends and support groups online. We also had family carers who were now able to purchase subscriptions to things like Netflix or um, digital concert halls um, to allow them some time off from what was effectively now a 24 seven caring role at home. So as we can see, accessing the digital world was obviously very important to some carers. However, others used their SDS budgets on more practical things or things that helped with more general well-being. So for instance, um, bike sheds and washing machines. We had a, a whole range of, of items that people were able to purchase, in, including um, exercise equipment, art materials, musical instruments, household appliances and garden equipment. Basically anything which met an individual's outcomes Bearing in mind how, of course, that outcomes for most people um, during the pandemic um, would have changed. So this was very much about what do people need right now to be safe, to maintain their well-being, to help them continue with their caring roles. And again, as long as it was legal, this should have been, in theory, a fairly straightforward process. 
there were also some carers who didn't necessarily buy any new equipment, but used their SDS budgets for more direct assistance. So this is where they were able to choose what tasks they needed support with and when they needed them. So this included um, paying for personal assistance to carry out different tasks from normal or for doing different or additional hours, which better suited the needs of the person requiring care. Now it's probably worth stating that this choice over hours and tasks should have been something that was happening anyway, regardless of whether there was a pandemic. And it's one of the findings that many of us have found most surprising in our survey. It's, um, it is rather curious that it's taken an actual pandemic for people to feel that they were allowed to actually decide their own hours or activities that they would like their PAs to undertake. So moving on, while some carers use their SDS budgets to access support from external resources and services, others looked to their own families. This included um, using their SDS budgets to pay relatives to provide additional support at home, particularly where care providers were unable to provide any services um, or where the household were shielding. So the SDS guidance um, that was issued in May made particular reference to the fact that the pandemic was indeed an exceptional circumstance and that family members may be the only and safest care option for many who required support during lockdown. So as we can see from the examples, um, some carers were able to use their SDS budgets in a flexible way that suited their needs specifically, but there were others who were not even aware of this flexibility. In fact, 60% of the carers in our survey were unaware that the SDS, that their SDS budgets could be used in a more flexible way. The COVID-19 SDS guidance stated that local authorities should proactively communicate how SDS option one and two could be used um, during this pandemic. And it's obvious that this wasn't happening in practice. Those who were aware of the guidance um, told us that they had found out about this via social media or through friends and other carers and not necessarily from the local authority. So while there were many carers who weren't aware of the flexibility that they could have with their budgets, others quite simply were just not allowed. So in fact, 43% of carers who requested to use their SDS budgets more flexibly were told that they just couldn't do that. Um, a further 27% were still awaiting a decision around whether they were allowed to use their SDS budgets for alternative support or not. So some of the reasons that carers were given for not being able to use their SDS budgets in a more flexible way included um, Number one, that the SDS budget had to be used to continue paying their existing care providers or services. Um, and that, although partially true, is not, it's not entirely um, true. The second reason people were being given was that the SDS budgets could not be used to actually purchase items and that they should, con they should contact a charity instead if they wished to purchase items. Um, again, that is um, certainly not true. Um, a third reason people were given for not being able to use their budgets was they were told that SDS budgets could not be used in a flexible way unless the supported person or unpaid carer were in financial hardship. Again, that is simply not true. In some instances, no explanation was provided by the local authority for rejecting the request to use SDS in a more flexible way. So I'm sorry if you can hear that noise, but my um, neighbour has decided to start mowing his lawn in the middle of winter. Um, but we'll carry on. So there were obviously barriers that some carers experienced to using their budget flexibly and one of those in particular was around employing relatives. So around half of all carers who had asked their local authority if they could use SDS to employ family members during lockdown were told um, simply no. Some were told that this was in fact an inappropriate use of direct payment which again is nonsense. Um, only around one in four carers who had asked to use SDS to employ family members had had their request accepted. In some instances, 
the request was only granted after the carer challenged the original decision. For some carers, the request to employ family relatives was um, only granted with fewer hours and there appears to be very little support for carers who had taken on the role of an employer for the first time. For example, um, they may have previously been getting an option three but had now decided to take an SDS option one to become an employer. Um, and it's important to note that, it, that there's certainly support available to those who use SDS to employ people and the local authority should have made people aware of that and carers shouldn't have had to be just left to get on with it. So as we can see, there have been a range of different experiences of SDS during the pandemic. And fortunately, not all of them have been particularly positive. So one of the things that I think we should be considering at this stage is what do we want self-directed support to look like in a post-pandemic world? So I guess much of what we would like to see with regards to SDS as we move beyond the pandemic um, are things which should have already been in place. So for example, Number one, greater transparency and accountability in the decision making process. People are still awaiting decisions on um, whether they can use their SDS in a flexible way. In some instances, we have people in the same local authority um, where depending on who your social worker is, some are being allowed to use their SDS more flexibly and others are being told that it's just not allowed without being given any reasonable or valid reason. That really shouldn't be happening. Reasons for rejecting requests have often, as we've seen today, been um, quite nonsensical and certainly not in line with the guidance. Number two, there needs to be greater flexibility and personalisation of support. Again, this is something which should have been happening prior to COVID. So I've talked today about some of the good examples of people being able to use their budgets in a more flexible way. However, during the pandemic, um, I think some of us can't help but feel that the councils have perhaps missed out on a huge learning opportunity here to allow people to use their budgets in a, in a more novel way to meet their individual outcomes. It would have been a great way to, to perhaps evaluate what personalisation of support could actually look like when there are um, fewer restrictions in place. Number three, what people needed during this pandemic was social workers who could help them to navigate this new landscape that we had all found ourselves in. What they certainly didn't need were, were gatekeepers acting on behalf of the local authority. People with support needs needed to be trusted to make decisions about how to meet their own outcomes. And social workers should have been enabling and supporting those efforts and not preventing that due to received budget constraints. The social workers that I, I know, and I think most of you would know on a professional and personal level, have often gone into their profession to affect change and to enable people with support needs to effectively live their best lives. So I think it's about time we encouraged that and made it possible for social workers to actually do more of that in future. Number four, information and guidance about SDS needs to be accessible for all. And that includes staff as well as people with support needs and unpaid carers. Our survey highlighted that the majority of unpaid carers were unaware that they could use SDS in a more flexible way. And this is despite the guidance stating that this information should have been communicated in a clear and transparent way um, to people who were using the support. That information should have been made available in a variety of accessible formats, both online and in print. Doing so would have potentially improved the quality of life for disabled people, people living with long-term conditions and unpaid carers alike. Number five, there is um, a definite need for reduced bureaucracy in the system. The time taken for decisions to be made about whether somebody could use their SDS in a more flexible way was a huge source of stress for many of the carers and the people that they were caring for. At a time when the system needed to be more responsive and flexible, we were still finding that individuals' requests um, were being delayed due to the bureaucratic processes in place. Again, 
give social workers more autonomy to make those decisions around how budgets can be used. And finally, uh, number six, we need to acknowledge the crucial importance of the role that the third sector organisations play in providing people with information, advice and support and encourage local authorities to work more closely and in partnership with these local third sector carer and SDS organisations. So as we can see, um, it's obvious that there is still a lot to be done to make um, self-directed support more of a level playing field and as flexible, clear and personalised as possible. But many of us, um, I do believe, are hopeful that this can be achieved. Um, and can I just say thank you for your time today and if you would like to read the report in full you can do so by downloading using the link which will be uh, forwarded to you when you get the slides if you'd like to get in touch with anything that i've spoken about today or about the report in general my contact contact details are on there as well and um briefly can i just finally take the opportunity to bring to your attention the sds collective so this is um basically a group of individuals and professionals um who have an interest in self-directed support and um, during the pandemic we've been meeting regularly on a wednesday lunchtime via Zoom and um, some really interesting discussions that take place there. So please, if that's of interest to you, please do come along to discuss policy and practice. And, uh, and that's it from me. I will now hand you back to Arlene and thank you very much for your time today. Many thanks, Japana. Again, a fantastic presentation from you in relation to the experiences of unpaid carers um, around SDS during the pandemic. Um, I can see a lot of comments coming through already in terms of how interesting the presentation, but also how powerful it was in terms of some of that experience um, from people that, that are going through this just now. So I'm sure there's lots of questions for our speakers and I see we've got a few in now in the Q&A. Um, so if you have a question, please pop it in there um, so that we can get to it within the time that we have. Um, if you have a comment again in the chat section, which I see people are doing it and share it with panel and all attendees so that we can all have a wee look at what you've got to say. It's now time for the Q&A session. So I'd like to ask our panel to join us on screen now. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'd like you to turn on your microphones and do a short introduction, if you don't mind, just so that people know who you are. So Janet, we'll maybe start with you. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Janet Bigger and was involved in evaluating, well, I actually managed the, the project to evaluate the um, individual awards scheme for the Life Changes Trust. Thanks, Janet. Gillian from Age Scotland Orkney, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Gillian Skews and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Age Scotland Orkney. Um, I think I'm probably the furthest away than all of you, not unless there's somebody from Shetland here and I don't know about it. But <laughs> nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Gillian. And last but not least, Shapana, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there, I'm Shapana Hussein Ahmed. I'm, I'm the Partnership Development Officer at the Coalition of Carers in Scotland. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. So we've got a few questions in the Q&A section already, so I'm going to get started so that we've got time to, to get this um, going. So first question, um, do the panel see a time when Peter's good experience of feeling in control of his choices using self-directed support will become universal across Scotland and what will it take to reach that point? So maybe, Gillian, I'll maybe give that question to you first of all. So I suppose what we're saying is that there's still, listen to Japan as well, there's still a lot of patchy experiences in relation to SDS. So what do you think it would take for us to have a positive experience like Peter has had um, across Scotland? OK, this is a really difficult one to answer. And I can only speak from my own experience. And yeah. a lot of people maybe won't recognise this because we all live in different communities and different cultures exist and relationships are different. So I'll speak about mine and mine's a very positive one. And I know not everybody will... Uh, will will understand this and they won't have experienced it. But I'll, up here, I guess it's because we're a smaller community and people know each other. So relationships are really strong and you can't get away from anybody. You know, if you're walking, doing your shopping, you meet the social worker, you meet the person you care for, you meet everybody because there's only three supermarkets here. So you're going to bump into them at some stage. 
And I think the reason why it works so well up here is because of those strong relationships. And it's a trust that exists between myself from the third sector feeding directly in to the statutory services. And we are considered absolutely equal with them in the services that we deliver. So there's never any uh, angst between us and we're all there to do the best that we can for the individual. Now, how you roll that out amongst through the rest of Scotland is an interesting one. But I think what I would say is, is that relationships have to change and that goes on everybody's part, everybody's side, not just the statutory bodies, it includes the third sector and private providers as well. And people have to think about the individual and putting the individual at the centre of what we do and what is best for them. And if everybody can sort of do that, then the people that really need the help and support should get it. Because there's no reason, SDS doesn't need to be rewritten. SDS is there. You know, we've got everything there to work. It's getting it to work. And um, yeah, I, I really feel for people in other parts of the country when I hear of what's going on. And, but that's not something I recognise up here. But I do have to tell you something, you really have to work at it. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of time. And it takes a, a long, long time for people to trust you enough to allow it to happen. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but it's, no, it's all it is. Think about is what we do here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's the recognition, as you say, that the relationship is key. It's about, you know, the fact that it's it's about the community coming together, I suppose. And that also recognising that each community, but especially each individual is different. Yeah. So we need to make sure that, that we place great importance in that. And it's about the outcomes for individuals and the process yeah. to make that a reality for people. And I would um, say that we are included in the discussions with the statutory services about SDS, about what is best for the individual. Mm -hmm. And if I turn around and say, we're not the right people to do it, you need to go here, I do it. Mm -hmm. So no, So nobody really... Um, it's holding on to stuff, it's whatever is best to work for the individual. Thanks, Gillian. Shapana, just based on the fact that your survey was kind of national, if you like, so is there anything in particular that, that you've drawn from that, that that would maybe answer that question around what needs to change? Now, you did touch a lot on it in your last slide in particular, but I wonder if there's any key points that you maybe want to draw from that in terms of learning. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I really like this question because they're asking what, what will it take to reach that point? Um, and the thing is, it should, and, and as I said in my presentation, it should already be happening because yeah. um, the legislation's there. In fact, it's been there for a good few years now. And I think what all of us recognise, um, you know, particularly when we see ex varying examples across the country, is the implementation. So the implementation gap, which we all recognise, and, and I think quite importantly, um, for those of you who might not be aware, so there's currently an, an independent care or a review of um, adult social care happening. Yeah. We recognise that. And I think, I suppose it seems a bit of a, uh, as if I'm not answering the question, but I, but my thinking on it right now is the review, the independent review of adult social care are very aware and they're very keen to address this implementation gap. So my response to that would really be for now, let's watch this space. Let's see what comes out of that review. Let's see what um, their proposals are to address this implementation gap because we all recognise it and we're all getting a little bit sort of fed up about it, you know, because I think, um, you know, like Jillian said, this isn't about introducing new legislation. This is about how do we implement the current legislation in a way in which people have the same sort of equitable um, access to support regardless of where they are in the country. And I think um, the point made previously as well around it requires culture change, but in order to have effective culture change, it needs to come from effective leadership as well. So there's um, there's a huge responsibility that sits around um, how do the leadership um, display the qualities that we want to see um, you know, within within SDS across those local authorities. Yeah, thanks, Shapana. And just to add to that, the Life Changes Trust has been working with projects and other stakeholders to submit a response um, to the, the independent review of adult social care. And we've written a paper on that and that's available on our website. So I'm sure 
now that I've said that, that my um, director of comms will be putting a link, hopefully, to that in the chat. Um, that's kind of smooth transition, Deborah, if you're hearing me. Um, and SDA is very much prominent with features in that and the learning that we have gathered from a number of different projects that we funded, and in particular, the individual award scheme. There they are seamless what can i say um and also what we have done is hosted a number of sessions in response to the debate scottish government dementia recovery and transition plan um so part of um the the response to that has been around the learning and the approach um in relation to sds both post pandemic and, and the kind of the i suppose the reaction and the experiences for people during the pandemic we also were able to get um a, a meeting with derek feely the chair of the independent review of adult social care in november and again we're able to present a number of different um, case studies and learning including the experience of each scotland or orkney and many others around you know the value um of that collaboration and and very much placing individuals at, at the center of that okay so on to my next question um, or not mine, the attendees. So this is, um, who should hold the self-directed care budget, the carer or the client? Now, I know based on our learning from the individual awards, Jan, I'll maybe bring you in here in terms of how many people with dementia were using those awards. I think it very much is, is based on individual needs and people with dementia and the unpaid carer, you know, should have access, um, obviously depending on assessment and also um, issues potentially not for all but for some in relation to capacity so janet before i bring others in can you maybe talk about the individual award scheme that we ran and maybe who how many people with dementia if you know or how many unpaid carers accessed it or or the experiences of that yeah, um, and it did vary completely on depending on individual circumstances. So, yeah. you know, for for some people with dementia, um, they were able to be um, quite actively involved in in deciding on what to spend the money on and applying for it and and having those conversations. Um, as I said before, often with somebody they know well and trust. So this comes back to the relationships yeah. thing that um, that we were talking about a wee minute ago. Relationships were really important um, because. So people needed varying amounts of of support in, in in kind of accessing the individual awards, but very much often carers were involved um, as well. Sometimes wider family were involved. Um, so I, I mean, it's it's individual. Yeah. <laughs> you know, different people have different needs and different levels of capacity to kind of engage with the with the process. And um, and again, uh, I think as has already been said, it's it's time consuming as well. It does need somebody. It, it, people did use that level of support to help them think through what would make a difference to them, um, and and kind of think a bit creatively and have some ideas thrown into the pot about maybe what other people had used their money for, just to just to get to get thinking and talking. Um, and so all of that takes time, takes trust, takes a relationship. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's a right answer to whether it, no. it should be the carer or the or the person with dementia because it depends. Yeah, and I think Shabana, you also addressed that in your presentation around the, the role of social workers in terms of being enablers, if you like, you know, rather than gatekeepers, and and that will be very important about who then accesses or is is able to and encouraged to access self directed support. Is there anything that you want to add to that? Um, no, I think that's absolutely right, Arlene. I, I'll probably just to add that um, for those of you who may not be aware, um, if you are an unpaid carer, um, there was some new legislation passed a couple of years ago, the Carer Scotland Act. So within the Carer Scotland Act, you as an unpaid carer have a right to access self-directed support as a carer and not just um, you know, as part of um, the person living with dementia, part of their care package, if that makes sense. So in response to that question, so the question was who should hold the budget? In theory, both of you could. You could both have a budget all on you know, your own budgets. It's important to distinguish between um, sometimes there, so the, the, the care budget of the person with the um, social care support needs um, may not necessarily meet all of the unmet needs of the carer. So, which is why if you are an unpaid carer, I highly recommend that you would, um, that you get yourself an adult carer support plan 
through your local carer centre. So your adult care support plan, what that will do, it's a conversation around um, the impact that the caring role is having on a whole range of aspects of your life. So how is it impacting on your health and well-being, your finances, your employment opportunities, your ability to have a life alongside caring, your relationships, not just with the person that you're caring for, but you know, um, your sort of wider um, sort of family and social networks. So it's a whole range of factors that they would take into account. They would then look at whether um, your needs are being met by the package of the person that you're caring for. If not, then um, the local authority has a duty to support those needs. Um, so this, we're talking about a legal duty here, not just a, a nice thing to do, but an actual legal mm -hmm. duty. So they, they need to go th through that process with you then and offer you um, the option of all four SDS um, options. So in theory, both of you could have an SDS package. And I think the key thing also here to remember is if um, a carer has support needs, um, identified support needs, um, you cannot be charged for them. Okay, yeah. And that's a really key thing to remember because what we're finding, and this is probably a whole different um, seminar or conversation, but what we're finding is that um, sometimes, quite sneakily, um, carers' needs are being packaged with the person with support needs, yeah. um, uh -huh. needs and they are then being charged for them. Um, that's a little bit cheeky and it's certainly um, not in the spirit of the act. So um, the quick answer is you can both have one or um, depending on what the needs are. I think it's important to remember that even as a carer, you still have social care needs, even though you might not recognise them as social care needs. You do. You're an individual in your own right and you do have the right to have your own care package as well. Thanks very much, Savannah. That's really helpful. And obviously your, your contact details and the SDS Collective, in fact, we're on your last slide and we'll share that in the post-event email because I'm sure others might have some questions for you more directly. But thanks very much um, for providing that clarity. OK, so um, I think this might be a final question. We might have time for one more. Um, in terms of the costs of care, is there any situations in your experience, and this will be more for, for Gillian and perhaps Shabana, based on the experiences um, at the coalition, where a budget hasn't been sufficient to cover the cost of care, and families are having to pick up the shortfall. So Gillian, I'll maybe give you that one first to start with. Okay, yes, we have had that. And what we did was we went back uh, to social work uh, directly to them with the, the person that was involved and we got the person reassessed again. And it was as simple as that. Okay. Um, it was just a process again that you had to go through um, to allow uh, the assessment to be looked at again and again the social workers not be worried about somebody else looking at something that was done in the past because people's needs change we yeah. know that you know what you did six months ago may not be appropriate now so whoever it is that's going in on a regular basis into somebody's home to provide the care has to be aware of that as a worker and if it's not working feed it back in through the organisation uh, or if you're on your own, if it's a member of your family, back in to the statutory body again to come out and redo the assessment. And, and, and it worked. So that's what we did. Nothing stands still. No. Mm -hmm. It's a case Absolutely. of back and reviewing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if individuals are holding budgets themselves, again, the same rule applies that if they feel that their needs are changing or things are no longer working or things need to be adapted, they're a bit more flexible. Then, then come back to, to whoever they've been working with to access that budget to look at things being reassessed or re-looked at um, based, on, based on their needs. Absolutely. And as an organisation, we support people to do that, even if we're not providing their care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we will then go back with the individual and help them do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Gillian. Shabana, anything from your experience in terms of that or...? No, I would, I would agree with what Gillian just said there. I think I think often when you find yourself in that situation, um, certainly um, go for, ask for a review and reassessment. I think Gillian quite rightly also points out that people often need support with that. Um, I think that's a very difficult thing for people to firstly um, feel that they're even able to challenge a decision, um, you know, um, that the local authority have made. So... I think it's absolutely key that people are supported to make that decision, you know, through through organisations um, like Gillian and um, another third sector support organisations that are available. Um, and I think the only other thing I would add to that is sometimes 
I think people, and again, the, people often need support to do this as well. It's about looking at other options. So, for example, you know, when um, so the question was around, you know, if the support is costing more than the package, um, because often people feel like that because they are given just the one option or the one. Yeah. Um, they're only ever told about one level of support. But I think we talked about this the other day as well, Arlene, that sometimes it's about taking the conversation right back and stripping it right back and thinking, what's 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 fundamentally at the bottom of this? What is it that you actually want to achieve? Because often it's not a service that you need, you know, it's an it's an outcome that you want to achieve. Yes. How many other ways can we achieve that outcome? You know, um, I mean, again, just in terms of an example, we were we were um, quoted um, well over a thousand pounds for my husband to go into respite for just, I think, for a, for a week or something. I can't remember. It was ridiculous and the amount was ridiculous. Um, we worked around that and um, he effectively goes to, um, you know, um, like a sort of premier in with support because, um, and that that for him achieves the same outcome. Um, which is a, which which is around getting away from our noisy kids, um, but you know <laughs> that's what it comes back to. You know what is the purpose of respite? Yes. You know I'm kind of half joking. I mean some of it is about getting away from the kids and the wife, but some of it is just about having some time on his own, and he can do that perfectly well in a in a fifty nine pound room premier in. You know um, with his support in the next room. Um, so it's about working out those types of solutions and knowing that it's possible. I think people are not given. Um, enough possibilities um, and are always presented with the choice or the service mm -hmm. and it should never start with the service it should start with what are your aspirations what is it that you would like to happen even if you can't see it yet right now even if you if you don't think that service exists what would what would you like it to look like and mm -hmm. let's start from that and let's let's build something from that and and I think I've always said this you know a lot of us um who access social care support have um, learned to be very frugal with our money, you know, for various reasons. We know how to find the best bargains. So, you know, and I've always said this, you know, um, let people commission their own care because people yeah. know where to, people know how to meet their needs and they'll do it um, well within the budget every mm -hmm. time. And that's a great message because, you know, I think what the individual awards and, and Janet will certainly um support this is what what that's essentially what that was about you know it was about giving people ownership and control of that budget um and having that trust in that relationship and making the process you know a simple and accessible one so that and and what we saw was that that people could be trusted to spend money and spend money well and and central to that was about having that kind of open and honest conversation about you know what would make a difference to your life what would you know what is it that matters to you and then building whatever it was around that and um, rather than you say starting from the other end of the scale about starting from the kind of service speak about you know what is it you need what do you need to be done for you rather than asking you know what is it that would make a difference to your life and I see some comments coming through um from the the chat Agnes is saying you know advocacy is you know a good way to, to be supported. I think that's something that she's used. Um, other comments have included um, the wee look. Um, enablers and gatekeepers is, is definitely an experience that some people are having in relation to access. And just Shavana, your, ex your response in relation to, to outcomes and, and good use of budgets. So thank you very much. What a great panel discussion. Um, um, in such a short space of time, I think a lot of people will, will be able to take um, a lot of learning from that forward in their own lives and also um, talk to others that are experiencing it in different ways as well. So it's for me to say thank you to our panel um, for today and um, to bid you farewell and I'll then take care of some closing remarks. So thanks everyone. We're now at the end of today's webinar. I want to say a huge thank you um, to everyone for making this happen. I think what we have seen um, from today's session is that, you know, there is some really positive experiences um, around the use of small grants, both from the learning from the Trust's Individual Award Scheme and also from some of the examples um, around um, self-directed support. What we are also seeing, though, that there are still some real challenges and barriers around for people, um, both before the pandemic and also during the pandemic. And actually, that it doesn't need um, a policy change, but all but what it needs is better implementation of that policy. 
and central to that is um, looking at it from an outcomes um, point of view and listening to people with dementia and unpaid carers about what matters to them and giving them the choice and control and flexibility to enable that to happen. It's been a real pleasure today to chair and I hope everyone has enjoyed it and will take away some of that learning today. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, Janet, Shabana, Gillian, and of course, Peter and his dog, um, Lottie. I'd also like to thank Outside the Box once again for that fantastic animation, which illustrates really well the impact of the individual award scheme. Um, and I'm sure a number of you, once we publish um, the link to this webinar, will be using that for your own learning and sharing it amongst your own networks. We will email everyone with a link to the recording for today um, of this webinar in the coming days, as well as posting information on our social media channels and through our monthly e-bulletin. And finally, thank you all, our attendees, for joining in today, for posting your comments, for posting some questions as well, um, and for really just getting um, together with us um, to allow us to share some of the learning um, as we move forward. So just to say thank you, um, have a pleasant day, and stay safe and well, and we'll see you all, I am sure, in the new year. So thanks, everyone, and goodbye.